everybody. I'm Ruth Ann Butler. I'm the Media Events Coordinator for the Never Again Coalition. And on behalf of Never Again and all our co-presenters, I'd like to welcome you to our morning's conversation around identity in the Sudanese diaspora that we've entitled, Who's Sudan? We are so privileged to be joined this morning by producer of Revolution from Afar, Makawi Makawi, in conversation with three members of the Revolution from Afar cast, Hajar Mohammedin, Rami Dawood, Wafa Saeed, whom you've already met if you've seen our past two events. And we also have a, another additional special guest, Dao Daldal, with us this morning. I'd like to start with a technology acknowledgement. This is something that we have just started to do with a series and it was inspired by land acknowledgements of First Nations presence in the United States territories and also by our work on conflict minerals and our recent event and screening of the film Sema in May. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Rising Up for Human Dignity film and discussion series has become a completely online event, as many things in our lives have these days. With that in mind, we'd like to acknowledge that our organizers, performers, panelists, and audience members are able to participate in the programming by using devices that contain in their essential components tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold, which are known as conflict minerals. Fueled by corporate greed, consumer demand, government policies and inaction by the international community. The extraction from the earth and sale of conflict minerals has motivated and perpetuated armed conflict and contributed to societal instability, rape and other extreme forms of violence, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We are grateful for this means of communication and connection that rely on these precious resources and we affirm our commitment to use them to advocate for peace and justice in the countries of their origin. You can find out more about Conflict Minerals and our work at www.neveragaincoalition.org forward slash Conflict Minerals. Again, thank you so much for being here this morning. I'd like to introduce our host for our conversation and then we'll, we'll dive into what I think promises to be just a, a really fascinating and um, deep conversation judging from what's gone on in our last two panels. I think that um, we're just gonna be really brought into some fascinating territory and some powerful insights through this. So our host this morning is Makawi Atif Makawi. He describes himself as a Sudanese American biologist and wannabe filmmaker and photographer. I think that anyone who has seen Revolution or any of his other works know that wannabe is probably a vast understatement. Makawi first got interested in film by accident in his late high school years, starting with a deep love and appreciation for movies and TV shows that molded his younger years and eventually transformed into a love of still photography, informed by cinematic lighting and techniques, everything he learned from practicing still photography and analyzing his favorite movies and TV shows inspired him to delve back into the world of filmmaking, and he hasn't looked back since. Um, Macaulay is also just an incredibly reflective and insightful individual that I've had the pleasure of talking with uh, in preparation for this panel, and I'm really looking forward to, to how he guides this conversation. Thanks, Macaulay. I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ruth. And that's very kind of you. I, I don't know what to do with myself sometimes on these Zoom meetings. I'm like, ah, I'm too, too embarrassed. Don't look at me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you. As, as Ruth Ann said, my name is Macaulay Macaulay, uh, Sudanese American, grew up in Denver, Colorado, uh, biologist, filmmaker, so on and so forth. But uh, more importantly, we're here for these four amazing people. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce them, um, and then I'd like them to take over and speak a little bit on their past, their connection to um, the subject of the film, and so on. So first we have uh, Hajim Hamadan. So she is actually in her final year for her doctorate in pharmacy with a concentration in global health at the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. Wafa Saeed, community leader here in Denver, uh, family friend from back in the day, and uh, entrepreneur. So she's also actually the first uh, national executive director and a board member with SAPA, the Sudanese American Public Affairs Association. Uh, then we have Rami Daoud, who's a Sudanese American rapper and actor who all, uh, actually also starred in uh, Bentley's previous film. Um, and uh, he has a very diverse background and upbringing that has really informed his art and led him to becoming an award-winning artist. And uh, we have Dao Dudu, a member of the Gates Millennium Scholars Program and has a background in international relations and has worked with a number of organizations that uh, aim to improve the lives of the disenfranchised. And uh, he's also a podcaster here in Denver uh, at the Ubuntu pod uh, podcast that aims to bridge the gap 
um, between Africa and the diaspora. So uh, how about we throw it off to Rami if you want to introduce yourself a little bit more. Yeah, thank you for the great introduction, Makavi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Rami Daoud, as uh, if you have been in the previous panels, you've already met me, uh, hip hop artist slash actor. Um, I've done some organizing work as well as uh, I was in a organization called SAND last year, Sudanese Americans for Nonviolent Demonstrations, which we've helped um, organize some uh, protests here in the U.S. in support of the revolution in Sudan. Um, I've done community work as well, and I'm just excited to be part of this conversation with uh, all these amazing people here. So thank you for having me and allowing me to be a part of this. Sir, sir. Hadji? Hi everyone, um, like Makawi said, my name is Hajid and I'm in my final year of pharmacy school and I'm, I'm doing a concentration in global health. So um, that essentially is like my passion in terms of like access to medications and just sustainability. And that actually came from going to Sudan and just seeing the lack of access to medications. So that's something I'm very passionate about. Um, and I'm really excited to be on this panel with everyone today. All right, now. Hello, y'all. My name is Dao Dodo. Uh, my background is international relations. For me, I always connect it back you know, to when I was when I was a child during the Civil War, uh, growing up the refugee. I was kind of like my first, quote unquote, the international arena of politics and all that good stuff. And then being able to move to the States as a refugee. I grew up in Denver, Colorado. And so before I left Denver, I came out here to, the, to Washington, D.C to study international relations uh, at American University. And so my background is just kind of my concentration is US foreign policy, I would say development, security, and just politics. And so, uh, you know, being connected to the Sudanese community, politics was always there. And so it was never something that was foreign. And so I was just kind of, it was always just my passion, just people talking about politics, history. Uh, I loved it all and I just dived into it. And, is what inspired me and my friends to start a podcast, the Ubuntu podcast. And so just uh, to talk about conversations that we rarely talk about in our community, the conversations that are difficult, the conversations that are seen as taboo uh, to further and also to heal our community. And for us, how do we move forward uh, and emancipate ourselves moving into the future? And so that's just a little bit of All right, thank you, though. I appreciate that. Uh, Wafa? Oh, Wafa, I think uh, you're still muted. Yeah. Oh, there you go. All right, is that better? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Wafa Saeed, and um, my background is also in pharmaceuticals, kind of along with what had just said. Um, I used to go to, back to Sudan a lot, and I just noticed that there was this deficiency in regards to getting health and getting the right medication to people, so I wanted to make sure that I helped in that capacity any way possible. Um, I was on the board for SAPA and also the national executive director um, and kind of played a role in regards to the convention last year. And um, with the convention and kind of just everything happening with the revolution, we wanted it to be a space where everyone can, you know, begin the process of healing after everything that was going on. and. Um, just from watching the movie, you guys absolutely were able to take that and put it into, into you know, in, in live. And I just really appreciate you all for doing that. Um, I also did work with Rami in regards to sand and trying to help Sudan in any way possible that we can. Um, and it's just really important to me that we somehow are helping Sudan. So thanks. So oh, thank you for that. Um... So yeah, I guess we should just jump in because uh, these 60 to 90 minutes really fly by on these Zoom <laughs> meetings. Uh, so obviously the big through line in the film, if uh, to anyone that has seen the film, is the idea of identity and duality and that you know internal conflict. So, and that's the theme of this, uh, this panel. So I kind of just want to jump right into it and ask um, whoever wants to take a, uh, take a question first. So prior to the revolution, because that was kind of a, a, a major shift in a lot of our lives in the diaspora. Um, prior to that, was there any defining moments at any point in your lives that 
challenge your concept of identity or made you like think about what that meant to you? Um, if anyone wants to jump in and feel free. Yeah, uh, I would like to start it off, us off. Uh, I think for me, identity is, it's, it's really interesting, I think, when it comes to as just being African in America. It was, I think, the first time moving to America. And, you know, coming from my identity, my identity back in Sudan was, you know, your ethnicity, right? And so I knew my ethnicity. Uh, that was something that I was proud of. I knew the ethnicity of my friends, right? Uh, we, we shared, you know, just our cultures, our languages. Uh, so it was ethnicity for me. And then identity, it's just when I came to America, I was like, oh, I'm Sudanese. I came to the U.S. in 2005. So I was like, I'm Sudanese. People ask, what are you? I said, I'm Sudanese or I'm African. And so that was kind of like my, and then when I came to America, the idea of race, you know, just kind of completely challenged just the idea of identity because I, that was never something that was in my vocabulary. What was race? Uh, so race was just introduced to me. It was like, you're a black man. And I knew I was a black man, you know, coming. It was just like, it was like, I, it wasn't something I could deny that I'm a black man, but it was just the concept of race of being and being a black man, particularly in Colorado, you know, Colorado, a state that is predominantly white, you know, uh, being a black man and being so distinctive just because I was a black man was just something that I challenged my idea of what is identity and how does society form identities over time and what impacts does it have on society? For sure, for sure. Do you think uh, there was like a point, like do you remember any specific point where you had to reconcile that like that, that conflict of like, well, I've never had to deal with this side of what identity was was there something specific or was it just kind of like a slow burn that we all kind of feel in some way or shape or form, you know, just living in uh, America? Does that make sense? That makes sense. Definitely makes sense. I think it's just the perception of how things change, right? Uh, coming from Kenya necessarily, uh, where I live in the refugee camp where I had different nationalities and different ethnic backgrounds, you know, it was, you know, it was Sudanese from all different ethnic backgrounds in the refugee camp, and then Somalis and Ethiopians. Uh, so that didn't make a difference for me because I came from such a diverse background. The people I grew up with as a child coming to the United States, it wasn't any different whatsoever. Now the diversity was in races. And so it was just, you know, you have blacks, you have whites, you have Latinos. And so that identity that you were confirm, confirmed to in a way where, you know, you were with the black people, right? It's just in a way because our society is so segregated in such, when, we, when I came to the United States, my friends were refugees, you know, other, um, other immigrants and black Americans. And, but the idea, you know, to cross boundaries and have white friends, my white friends were just the one in school and that was it, that was right there, you know, being in middle school. But like, my friends who were in my community were people from my background who were immigrants, African immigrants, uh, refugees, and you know, Middle Eastern immigrants. And so those were my friends, people who were close to my background. And in a way, it's just like society was just like, oh, you guys are the immigrants, you're the refugees. And so we just had that understanding and that commonality that brought us together compared to, you know, later on, you know, growing up and going to university where you develop more deeper level friendships with people from other different, uh, you would say race, right? Uh, white Americans who I didn't have you know, a sense of relationship with until I became an adult. Interesting, I appreciate, appreciate you for sharing that, thank you. Um, Hadja, do you have uh, anything you wanna add? Yeah, I, th I think for me, um, like growing up in Philadelphia, I had, um, I was very fortunate in the sense that like we grew up in a hilla in terms of like there were so many Sudanese people so I never felt like I was out of touch with my culture they made sure we, ha we had like Saturday schools and stuff like making sure that we didn't lose touch with Arabi and just the cultural and just celebrating Independence Day um, and all that nature and just the culture of Sudan um, 
but I know in the eyes of America, they just see me as a black woman. Um, but I was still confident in the sense that I knew I was Sudanese and I would always represent Sudan wherever I went. And then it's not like defining moments, but it's just small things here and there. Like, for example, like when like you're filling out an application and they're asking about race and like, you, do I identify as black slash Afri African American or do I put other because I'm Sudanese and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then so oftentimes I just find myself just putting black because that's what they see me as. Um, and then also just like, I feel like having to like prove that I'm Sudanese to other Sudanese people. Like for example, like when I would go to the US, to the embassy, the Sudanese embassy in New York, and I was trying to get a visa because I was going to Sudan soon. And um, I provided like my passport, um, my American passport. And then I provided that my parents' um, American passport, they were both born in Sudan. And then the lady was like, oh, well, I need to see their Sudanese passport. And I was just like, okay. So then I was like texting my dad. I was like, can you send me a copy of like your Sudanese passport? And then I gave that to them. And then she was like, um, now I need your birth certificate to prove that these are your parents and that like you were actually like like you related to them and I was just like I just kept like mouth shut I was like okay I'll do that for you and then it's just like yeah. and then she was like now I need you to like let them know that like you need to get something in writing that says that your dad is like giving you permission to go and I'm just like who do you think is like financing this trip and it's just like all those things for me to do just to like prove them Sudanese yeah. just to get this visa and it's just like I just feel like I constantly have to do that especially like with other Sudanese people um and it's draining actually yeah. draining for sure that draining is understatement right <laughs> that sounds oh my god <laughs> Literally. I'm getting stressed out just hearing it <laughs> uh whenever we uh, go back to Sudan and have to deal with like the whole visa nonsense uh I don't even have to deal with half of that and even that's exhausting <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Rami do you have anything you want to add Tsunami frozen? Okay. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. You, do you have uh, anything you want to add? I know you have a, a super interesting and diverse background, like places you grew up and kind of a yeah. world. Uh, so identity, uh, identity has been at the forefront of everything I do pretty much my entire life because I was born in Egypt um, and I lived there for the first few years and I came to the U.S. when I was about nine years old. So even, even before I came to the U.S., um, growing up in a society that uh, the majority of the people don't look like me or my family, um, that was right there in front of my face. Um, but I feel like as a child, you don't really, even though you might see things, you don't really question them because you're, you don't really have the ability to sit back and kind of zoom out and look at the bigger picture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I really started questioning identity when I started getting into music. Uh, specifically rap and hip-hop music because I was influenced greatly by Black American culture and that was a culture that uh, like I grew up in it. I was in the middle of it right when I first came to the U.S. So you start questioning things like well am I African or African-American mm. right or am I an African who became a neutralized American but the same no I'm not uh, black American in the sense that a descendant of African slave. Mm. You go, so there, it, it gets confusing when, you, when you're in your teenage years and all these questions are running through your head and you're trying to really find your place in society. Mm. And it gets even more difficult when you go back to Sudan and you still don't fit in because your family back home calls you the American boy. Yep. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, what the America, what, yeah. so it's like, <laughs> there's always been this battle. Yeah, there's always a battle. Um, I feel like everyone here can relate, like, no matter where you go, you're not really accepted fully. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't until recently where I kind of accepted that um, I'm, I'm who I am and I don't have to let anyone label me or put me in one single box. Mm -hmm. For sure. And that's a one hell of a, like, a thing to ponder, right? Like, it's not that easy to reach that state of, like, comfort with yourself to be like, I'm just who I am. And but if you, anyone else has an opinion, it doesn't really matter, right? Because that it's hard to not care about other people's opinion when people's opinions are so damn loud, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate you for sharing that. Thank you. Wafa, do you have uh, anything you want to add? Oh, yep, there you go. <laughs> um, I just kind of echo what everyone was saying. Um, it really is a struggle, and I feel that, you know, it's it's been a struggle every day for all of us. Um, because when we're at home, we're Sudanese. And then the second that 
you know, we close the front door, we have to, we have to kind of switch in regards to how we communicate with people, how we interact with people. And um, then that, that brings out our American side. Um, but even within, within our community, you know, here in, in America, we're, we're too much of one thing and too less of another thing. And that comes out in regards to, you know, when you're, when you're talking to the older community or where, when, you know, you're trying to kind of um, relate yourself with them. And, you know, it's, well, into you guys grew up here into Oblad del Balad, or, you know, you guys, you guys know more than us, and you don't know that much about Sudan. And it's like, well, I do, you know, and it's like having to always kind of validate that you are who you are. Um, it's, it is a struggle. And then, you know, like everyone said, going back home, um, having to be asked to say hamburger or internet and, you know, like, why do you guys, why do you guys, you know, not, not say it, say it like this, or, you know, like, it took tak with heroof or, you know what I mean? Just little stuff like that. Or, <laughs> so it's, it's a constant, constant, um, kind of always wanting to prove yourself to some capacity um that you are a hybrid of both yeah no that's for for sure Ugh, so exhausting just living is exhausting <laughs> but uh hey it makes for interesting stories right uh uh the next question i actually wanted to ask um and that i actually want to hear your opinion on this first um given your uh, um refugee past um I'm sure you all kind of noticed uh, a lot of third culture folks, um, first generation immigrants, uh, whatever, uh, especially during their formative years, um, find that because of how removed they are from their you know, parents' culture or their parents' home country, whatever, they feel a little bit like imposters from time to time. Obviously there are times where we don't feel that way. And, and like everyone just said previously, you feel like, well, why do I have to prove it, right? Because I know I'm Sudanian, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. I, don't, I shouldn't have to prove it to you. But for a lot of us, and I don't know if you can all relate to it, but there are a lot of times where even if we are, are getting tired of that, you know, having to prove ourselves, there's this sense of like, I mean, what do I know though? You know what I mean? I'm in a pot, like the, the whole imposter syndrome. I was wondering, did that ever cross your mind? Like, did, is that something you ever had to like tackle, you know, inside yourself when you, during that, you know, big transition between, you know, culture and home and whatnot? No, for sure. It's I, I think it's just like like it's just once you go through all those different cultures, right? I you know being born, then you know what's now part of South Sudan, and just leaving Sudan, then growing up in Kenya, you know, just now I'm just assimilating to a whole different country with cultures, different you know ethnicities, interacting with people and nationalities I never met before, you know first time meeting Ethiopians and Somalis, you know, I didn't know that there were other African people. I thought the whole world was just Sudan, you know, because that's all I did, was hearing when I was a child. That's all I knew. It was just like my hometown, people who were from my hometown, who looked like me, you know, who spoke different languages. And that was, that was it for me. That was the whole world until I went to Kenya and just first time seeing the world being presented to me. It just kind of created, you know, it creates, you're like, well, what am I, right? And so I think my mom, is just at such an early age, was just like, you go out there, you are part of that society. You come back in here, you're Sudanese, you're proud of it. You speak the language, you eat my food, you know, uh, and you practice your culture. But once you step out, you're part of that culture. And so in a way, it's just like that has helped me and my siblings in a way assimilate and adopt part of that culture, but also keep my culture and my language, you know, and be the bridge in a way between you know between her and that world because i think as kids we're able to assimilate and adopt cultures much faster than our parents we have an understanding of societies that we're moving into better than our parents because our parents you know you know they grew up in one place their whole lives now they have to get up and move you know everything they knew they love their whole life you know completely just abruptly and just get up and move Compared to us, we were kids, you know, we were naive and we didn't have an understanding of what was going on back then, you know, until years later is in understanding what was going on and why we had to leave our homeland. And so it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's something that I have, it, you know, when I go home, when I, I remember going back home, having conversation with my grandfather and he would be like, your dinka is broken. I was like, wait, what? 
I speak fluent Dinka, right? Or just my uncle's like, your, your Arabic is terrible. I said, yeah, I know, because I did not grow up in, in the educational system where I was taught in Arabic, right? And so it's just, it's the, that idea, the language you speak itself, where you think yourself, you're fluent in it, being questioned. Because, you know, you, it's not, it's a different dialect. It's a fusion of, you know, languages that you have adopted and added along the way. And, so, and that's okay. It's just, I always knew for me, it's just like, once I come to my household, it's just like, that's my African culture. Once I step out, it's like, hey, I'm American, right? And so that idea, in a way, kind of created where it was just a separation between my African culture, but also my American culture to where, in a way, my home was Sudan, you know, it was Africa for me. And so it was comfort for my mom because that, that was all she knew. Uh, and when we went outside, it was comfortable for us because we assimilate ourselves into the American culture to be able to function in it and thrive and somewhat try to thrive by going to school and getting an education, building friendships, you know, from people from different backgrounds that I still have to this day. Yeah, for sure. I totally agree with that. Um, funny enough, I think to the you know, to your point, like you know, because of how easy it is for uh, children to absorb language and culture at you know younger ages, because of how multiple their brains are, right? I actually thought it for for me uh, personally, um, it actually made things a little more difficult um, in that distinction, because that distinction you were talking about, like in at home, I'm Sudani, right? At, you know, outside, I'm American, whatever. Um, depending on like the context of where you're at, right? Mm -hmm. It started because of how much, you know, I started absorbing the American culture and how much I became like, like you said, right, the bridge for my parents, you know, to this new country that they don't really know what to do with at that time. That, that line started becoming super, super blurred. And so at some point I was like, oh shoot, I don't know. I speak Arabic fluently. <laughs> I eat Sudani food, like it's nobody's business. That's how I got all this heft. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? I was like Sudani down the board, right? But as that line started getting more blurred, is it felt more like the, you know the question was um, suggesting, like more. I, I felt more like an imposter. I didn't, I didn't really know how it felt because like I was the bridge for my parents. So I didn't know how how hard it was for them to need a bridge, right? I didn't know how hard it was for my cousins who maybe look at us like you know even though here in the states we were struggling, dirt poor, but then my cousins look at us like oh my god, you guys. <laughs> you got go to school for free. You have a school bus. You know what I mean? Like the, the privilege that you didn't realize you had until somebody's like slaps you in the face with it, rightfully so. Started blurring that line. And that's when the imposter syndrome, you know, really flared up for me. And and it didn't. It wasn't until like later on in my life that I started being able to like reconcile a little bit. So I, I was wondering, you know, Rami, Hajir, Wafa, do any of you guys have it, have you ever felt that, you know, uh, removed from the thing that you have to prove yourself so often to be a part of yeah and i still get my authenticity question till this day like uh especially being in in in, in like the hip-hop world you got sudanese even sudanese people that identify as black africans they'll still be like you're rapping which is black american culture like you know what i'm saying like they're they're not like us We're, and so they, they, they say, like a lot of people, or they be like, uh, why don't you sing like we do, like classical Sudanese style? And they fail to understand that, listen, I didn't grow up in that world. Yeah, I listened to it and because my parents would listen to Sudanese music and, and I'm influenced in one way or another. But I, that's, not, that's not what was around me in my childhood. I grew up listening to rap music and I became a rapper. So it's like, you get questions, or, or it like people question like, are you really is this something that you really stand for are you being real is this who you are or are you just are you just pretending are you copying off that culture and um and even the other like when you look at it from the sudanese perspective even if i use rap music to highlight sudan or whatever some people will say well he's only doing it because it's trending or he's only doing it to gain from it or whatever and it's like sometimes it hurts to be honest with you because Again, like this is who I am, but people question your authenticity and, and uh, where do you draw the line? Like, where do you draw the line? Like, are, am I really, am I really doing this because it's who I am, and or or is it true that people what they say about me and uh, 
you just get questioned from every direction, man. You get questioned all the time. And people just really fail to under people that don't go through it, they fail to understand what mm. it's like to be searching for an identity your whole life. Right, right. It's a long ass search. But uh no, I totally agree, man. Um and I appreciate you for sharing that. Uh Wafa, do you have anything you wanna add to that or um Honestly, I feel that we we get, you know, the the imposter syndrome really comes from other people. Um, you know, when we're questioned in regards to what Ami was saying about being your authentic self, and when you try to be your authentic self and then it gets questioned in every direction, um, you start doubting who you are and, you know, what, what you're wanting to represent or how you're wanting to be to to be viewed in, um, in all aspects of life. And, um, for me, it really was, you know, being, being, a being a, 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 a dark skinned girl, being American, being Sudania and being a hijabi in America, you know, that was an extra layer that was added in regards to, okay, well, you know, you're in America, you, you don't have to wear it or, you know, things of that sort. It's like, this is who I choose to be for myself. And I don't think that, you know, representing who I am, whether it be physically, emotionally, mentally, is anyone's business. Um, that kind of comes from who I am and what I was taught to be or what, you know, what, what kind of makes me who I am. Um, but then, you know, you start questioning like, okay, well, if I'm too American for my Sudanese side and I'm too Sudanese for my, for, for my American side, then where, where do I, where, where do I fit in? You know what I mean? Because there isn't really going to be a place where you fit in completely. Um, and it even shows up, I think, you know, when talking about marriage, for example, you know, a lot of for the guys, they get the, oh, well, they're too American for my daughter. And the daughters get, well, they're too American for my son. And it's like, well, we have another part of us as well. We're not just this, this one thing. We were, we were given the opportunity to live in a world that's blended with all these different cultures, but to be able to take from it all and, you know, build what we want ourselves to be. Um, so I think with the imposter syndrome, it's really, you have to be true to yourself first before you can be true to anyone else um, and kind of not let that, you know, hold you down in regards to what someone is going to say about you or how they're going to view you. For sure. No, that's, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, Hadjid, I, I'm curious to hear what you feel about this, uh, given your story just now with like the whole embassy situation and also like what you spoke on in the movie with, uh, how like the whole rest of Sudan turned a blind eye to that for, how does it like, does, does that imposter syndrome, if, if you even feel that at all, that is right. Does it feel different when now that's even a factor where your own country is all types of messed up? Um, I wouldn't say like, it's necessarily imposter syndrome for me. I think it's just like, it's always that internal conflict conflict of just like seeking approval from other people but I think at the same time it's just human nature especially like being black where we have to constantly prove we belong in spaces and like and it's come to the point for me it's like I'm not allowing myself to do that anymore like I I'm more than enough I don't need to prove myself to anybody to tell them oh I'm Sudani enough or I'm American enough or I'm black enough because this is who I am and this is just a result of me growing up outside of Sudan and just experiencing a different culture um, in that essence. So I, I wouldn't say it's like an imposter syndrome for me. For sure, for sure. Thank you for that. Um, now I wanna jump into kind of how a lot of us in the diaspora treated um, the revolution as uh, it was happening. Um, I'm curious, like, I, I wonder what different people's like opinions are on why they felt so passionate about um, being so active online with social media, with protests outside of the country. Um, it seems like uh, pe some people I talk to, it's because they feel so strongly like I'm Sudanese, that's my home, they're revolting. Other people are like, well, I don't really know how I, you know, I don't really know that world. I was born here, raised here. I've never seen my family there, disconnected. But I feel a kinship and I want to feel that, you know, connection to, to a home base of some sort. 
does do you guys feel like uh there were any other reasons that got you guys so passionate about um your own activism during the revolution and afterwards and who um, wants to take this yeah so for me uh, I feel like I was passionate about it before the revolution. Um, obviously, like there's personal reasons, like over the years having family members being killed or imprisoned or whatever. But I look at it like even the reason why I grew up here and we go through the things that we're now talking about, the identity issues and such, is because of that regime that was in power, right? Like, for example, my father didn't, he wasn't able to go to Sudan for 20 years because of just his political views did not match with the regime, right? Mm. And in, 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 in going along with that, like, I was raised in a whole different world. I didn't, like, we miss out on the opportunities of being born with our, or being uh, growing up around our cousins and our aunts playing in the streets, you know, like, and, and we miss out on these things because of that regime, right? Mm -hmm. There's a reason why we're immigrants and such. So, um, you know, my father being active in politics or whatever, maybe obviously it had a big effect on me being aware of these things at such a young age. So for me, um, like I said, I've just, it's something I've always been passionate about prior to the revolution. Mm, for sure. Anybody else have something to add? Um, I would say for me, like, just, like, in terms of my childhood, like, along with me and, like, a lot of, like, my Philly friends, like, my childhood consisted of me attending rallies for Save That Fort. Like, we would go to the protests in New York and D.C., so, like, that's what I knew. And, like, from a young age, I was encouraged to speak out, and I was aware of what was going on in Sudan because my parents and the community around me knew about it. Um, and then just like going back to Sudan and just seeing how people were treated, particularly like going to Niala and cast every chance that I get. I just like, I felt a sense of duty to educate others about what was going on. And then at the same time, I feel guilty in that I'm able to tap out when I want. So mm -hmm. say, for example, if anything went down in that forward, I know that the American embassy or I could have a ticket out back to the US. And I think for them, they don't have that luxury of leaving their home it's mm -hmm. day in and day out of what they're experiencing and i think for me it's the least thing that i can do is educate other people about what's going on because if i was in their position i would want someone to speak out and advocate for me mm -hmm. for sure Dal, do you guys want to add anything yeah i just want to add to that i think for me it was too, uh, because when i fled sudan it was during when the oil boom happened in, 19, in the, 19, the late 90s, uh, when the government was just basically clearing uh, people off the oil regions uh, between the north and south. And I'm from Abia, and so my home region is an oil region. And so my family was displaced from my homeland uh, because that's when the oil insulators were being put down. And so because of just the consequences of the war and the government clearing people off their home region, that's when my family fled my home region uh, in 1998 and my family became refugees because of the direct consequences of the regime actions. And so I always been political about Sudan. I always, it's just, I always knew why my family had to flee, you know, seeing, seeing certain, just seeing it firsthand as a child, you know, just being in your introduction of war and having to leave your homeland because of war, uh, growing up in the refugee camp and understanding why I was there, the reasons I was there. And so by the time I came to the States, I knew, you know, I knew the reason why my family left uh, the country. Uh, I knew why I didn't get the chance to grow up back home, you know, with family or my family is, is displaced all over the world, you know, have family, you know, in Khartoum, in Egypt, in Ethiopia, in Uganda because of the war. And these were the direct consequences of the war. And so Sudan was always a passion for me just because of these firsthand experience. And so I remember it was like during 2005 when the CPA was signed, you know, uh, when Dr. Jungar went to Khartoum. Uh, I remember, you know, when the referendum was coming up and just how big of a deal it was, you know, here was Africa's biggest country, you know, battering, you know, the issue we're talking about, identity. And it, what, what place does it have in Sudan? And what, the, what does identity mean in, it just in the Sudanese context? 
and it's just the issues it has presented for us. And so go, going to rallies, you know, uh, during, you know, the genocide, you know, you know, genocide of Darfur uh, happened in Darfur. Uh, I remember after the referendum happened, the war immediately started in South Kordofan and Blue Nile and having to go to rallies uh, because these were people who just came out of war too, because the CPA was signed in 2005. They fought in the civil war for the last 23 years. And then they were going back to war being bombed immediately after the South succeeded. And so Sudan was always for me, it was just, it, oh, it was a, a, a conflict within myself. You know, here was something I was always proud to be, but felt and never truly accepted me, you know, uh, just from the context of, I did not get to experience my country and its, you know, its beauty and what it has to offer to me. You know, I lived the majority of my life outside of Sudan, you know, on the first three years in Sudan and fled. And so when the revolution happened, I was happy because I was like, now my people can see what I've been seeing and feeling for the last 20 plus years that I have been alive. And so it was, it was one of, you know, of joy, but also of grief. Why didn't we do this earlier? What prevented people from seeing the system for what it is, the regime for what it is, and the crimes that was committed against the Sudanese people? And so, and so it was just, when the revolution happened, it was, I was, I think I finally came to peace within myself that, you know, maybe the future, the future has something better to offer for the Sudanese people. For sure, for sure. And funny enough, like, like you said, and like what uh, Hajir said, um, because my parents, like, uh, like your dad, I mean, my parents are super political uh, to the point that it makes going back to Sudan a whole logistical mess. But uh, <laughs> Because of that reason, like, and because they were my only window to Sudan at that time, um, I knew about things going on back home through them because they were so active. So the situations in Darfur, the Nuwa Mountains, uh, the South, everything like that. And so to me, it felt like, okay, it was, you know, like you guys said, you go to these Darfur rallies and all these other rallies throughout, you know, your childhood with your parents and you think, yeah, this is, you know, this is what we all know and accept. And it wasn't until actually what um, had you, funny enough, I'm sure you're getting tired of hearing about this because everyone mentions this scene in the movie, but it was while I was filming your scene, right, with Ilaf, that it really dawned on me that there were people denying it, right, that it ever happened. Because to me, I was like, I mean, one plus one equals two, this shit's been happening <laughs> forever. You know, I've been to rallies as a five-year-old, not knowing what I'm doing, holding little, you know, signs bigger than me. And it wasn't until you mentioned that, I'm like, oh, shoot, that's, that's a big problem that really needs to be addressed. And so it made me start wondering like, well, then what, what was different about this revolution? Is it, uh, is it the colorism and tribalism that finally, you know, made people care because it involved people they care about, right? Because um, Sudan, that's actually one of the questions later on. I want to get into the idea of colorism and tribalism specifically in Sudan. Um, I, I, I was curious, like why, what about this revolution was different? Um, without, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, you know, I always say when talking about this that we fell in love with Sudan through our parents' eyes. And um, what I mean by that is we fell in love with Sudan in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And our parents came here, you know, like mid 80s, late 80s, early 90s. So they weren't present for kind of the Omar al-Bashid regime. Um, and they heard about it just as, as we've heard about it. So they didn't get to experience it as much. Um, and I think that really played a role in regards to, you know, how we felt about Sudan because, you know, the image of them growing up is the image that I had in my head before going to Sudan. And that's what I fell in love with. And when the first time I went back to Sudan, I was in shock that it wasn't anything that they had told me about. <laughs> and it was very much, um, you know, different in regards to just how the people were and how people were living. And I, I even asked my mom, like, are you sure we're in Sudan? Like, this is the Sudan where you grew up. Are you, are you sure? And so um, I think for us, it's really with the revolution, it was more of um, being able to find a little bit more of ourselves in it, 
um, and being able to say like, you know, this, this is where, this is the change that we're able to make. This is where we can come in and be able to help our people, um, whether it be from America or whether it be, you know, them out in the front lines, we're able to bring awareness and we're able to support them. Um, but we're also able to amplify their voice. We're able to, to, you know, put them in a position where they weren't able to, um, to come out and say like, this is what's happening in our country and this has been happening. And it's not just Khartoum, Umdurman, Bahri. This has been happening in Darfur and South Sudan. This has been happening in the Nuba Mountains. And this has been happening to our people, whether you know related to us or not, they are our people. And um, with the revolution, that for me was my biggest thing is that I wanted to make sure that if I was representing Sudan, I was representing all aspects of Sudan and all aspects of the people of Sudan and making sure that their voices were heard and their stories were being told. For sure, I totally agree. I think that the reason we feel that way, um, and I was wondering about this myself, like why was it like a, why didn't I, you know, oppose the, the news, like some of these people who gave into the propaganda, right? What about me and my family was different that made us understand like, yeah, this shit's been happening. People have been dying and homes have been burnt to the ground for way before this more recent revolution. And it made me wonder like, is it because I grew up here weirdly enough, right? Because here in the States, I didn't know, I didn't know what tribe I was, first of all, until like, I was a teenager and my dad accidentally told me. Um, I didn't know the distinctions, like the ethnic distinctions between Darfur and say Kassila or wherever, right? It all, whenever I found a Sudanese person, I was just happy to find a Sudanese American person, right? And so I'm like, oh shoot, somebody that understands this confusing ass life I live, all right, cool. We are gonna be best friends. And I thought maybe that's the, the reason why, like, you know, it was pretty easy for, for me to see the truth early on. Do you, I, I'm curious, do you guys feel similarly in like that, because of how small communities are here, like, or outside of um, Sudan in general, not just the States, that it, it leads to chipping away at that tribalist mentality? I feel like it all just depends on the way you grew up. Um, I don't want to say too much because I know you're going to ask us specifically about tribalism and colorism in a bit. Oh, oh no, let's that. just jump into it. Just take, <laughs> yeah. take over. <laughs> um, so, like when I first started making music, uh, I was in a group and my partner was uh, Sudanese. His father was Zaghawi and his mother was uh, Medob, which is from Northern Darfur. So even at that age from like, we started making music at like 11 and 12. At that age, I was aware of that. Like I remember specifically the moment I asked him, I was like, Gabil Tekshinu, because I, would, I wanted to know. And he said, mm-hmm. my dad is Zaghawi, my mom is Medob. And I was talk, telling him about like Nubian culture and such and so it all depends on how you grew up specifically and regarding tribalism I feel like we have to be very careful not to paint all of Sudan in the same with one paintbrush be, and, and this is something very important speci- specifically now post-revolution I know we all as people want S- Sudan uh, uh, they want us to be one united Sudan right and you will hear this all the time People would say, Nihnabas Sudanian, don't talk about whatever. And ironically enough, that's actually very dangerous. That's a dangerous rhetoric, right? Because my understanding of what it means to be Sudanese is different from yours. Right, right. Right? Hajir's understanding of being Sudanese is different from Dao's and Wafa's. And that's mm. okay, right? My Sudan or my Sudanese ness. It's not the same as somebody from a different region. And I feel like that's okay. Our right. unity needs to be in the acceptance of our diversity. Yes, sir. Because when you try to, when you try to um, paint everyone when, as the same color and with one paintbrush, you end up actually aiding in, in erasing mm. specific identities and specific cultures in the name of assimilation and unity. And all that causes is alienation. You alienate people, and it's just going to feed in the same cycle again. This is the mm-hmm. reason Dr. Garang picked up the gun and fought a 20-something year war. Mm-hmm. It's because there was one specific idea of what it means to be Sudanese, 
that was enforced on a country of, um, I don't know how many different peoples of thousands of different languages and backgrounds and ethnicities and tribes. Mm. And so we have to be very careful in that. Yes, we're all Sudanese, but Sudan is an umbrella that covers a lot of different subcultures from within. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's like the, the whole, I don't see color argument <laughs> that yeah. uh, I'm sure we've all heard plenty of times here. It just leads to more problems because then you completely ignore systemic issues that have plagued certain groups for a long time. It erases, like you said, culture, languages, whole experiences, essentially saying they're less significant than whichever one we decide is the dominant, right? Whatever arbitrary decision, you know, comes about that. But um, yeah, I totally, I couldn't agree more, man. I appreciate that. Uh, anyone want to add anything? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think it's just like when people say, oh, are you Sudanese? It was like, yeah, no. I'm proud of that, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm Sudanese, you know, it's just like, this is the land I can from. You know? Of course I'm proud of that. But I think when it comes to the Sudanese community and the idea of people have of what it means to be Sudanese, people have a completely different view. And mm. like, Sudanese is one thing and one thing only. It's like mm. when people, it's like, it's just going on Twitter sometimes, people, you know, post wedding video. This is what the Sudanese wedding is supposed to be. No, that's a Pacific. <laughs> Yes. The ethnicity of what that, you know, that particular ethnic wedding is supposed to be, which mm -hmm. is Sudanese, right? But that, that one thing is not all a, a wedding of how, you know, all over, over the 500 ethnicities that are in Sudan, you know, you know greater Sudan. That's, mm -hmm. that's not how every wedding is celebrated, right? And mm -hmm. so this is this idea where we have, is that in order to be Sudanese, we have to assimilate but, and leave everything that makes us us, leave it outside the door and don't bring it into the, into the room. And that's a very, very, very dangerous, you know, it's, it's a very dangerous, you know, president that we're setting because it's what caused the problems of the past that we have mm -hmm. had in the country for the last 60 years. And so our inability to accept our diversity and, you know, and have pride in our diversity, whether it's languages, cultures, ethnicity, they were there before there was such a country named Sudan when it was right. perfect in the Berlin conference, right? There wasn't a Sudan. There were just chiefdoms and kingdoms that existed, you know, ethnicities that existed in what is now Sudan. And so when we start to realize that, it, it, it makes it's okay to see someone, oh, that person is Nuba. Oh, cool. You know, people see me, rec immediately they recognize what I am based on my name. He's a Dinka. It's like, okay, cool. But that in, that in itself shouldn't give us ideas about misperceptions and stereotypes about that particular ethnicity, right? Because that's doing it wrong. We're feeding into the, the past propagandas of what the regime fed us, right? About that particular people. This is what they are. They're backward. You know, they don't want to assimilate into what it means to be Sudanese. So they're backward. We're going to go assimilate them and force assimilation where now we're erasing people, cultures and identities because of what we, of what we think and view to be Sudanese. Mm -hmm. For sure. No, I totally agree. Um, Wafa or Hajar, one of you unmuted. I didn't know who. <laughs> it was me. Um, I was just going to say, like, to touch back of, like, why people weren't speaking about, like, what was going on in that foot in the new mountains. I think it's just the out of sight, out of mind mentality in addition to the oh, it's not happening to me, so why should we care? Sprinkled with a dash of ignorance. Ignorance mm -hmm. in the sense that like, oh, like the government wouldn't do such thing. It's just the tribes fighting between each other. The government isn't capable of providing weapons to these tribes and doing the ethnic cleansing. And then in terms of tribalism, I noticed it early on and just like, like my parents made sure I knew what tribe I was from just mm -hmm. so I can be educated and I know my roots, but it was never in a sense that our tribe is better than another tribe. It was so that I knew for myself where I came from in my history. And then I think in my own eyes, I saw tribalism like being played here in the US, especially like particularly in the Philadelphia community. And so what transpired were like two Sudanese communities in terms of like two groups that held separate events. So one that was pro-government and one that was against the government. And it trickled down to parents dictating uh, what events their children can go to because which organization was hosting it. And I think like essentially it was like the pro-government were those who weren't ethnically cleansed, those who had more of a positive experience with the government. And then I think for me, you could just see that generational trauma being passed down to mm -hmm. us. And then it's like, you thought you escaped it in Sudan, but 
it was brought right back here to the States and outside. So it's just, it's crazy. Just like the whole circle of how everything just plays a role into the way that we carry ourselves and our relationships with each other as Sudanese people. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more that, yeah, that's, it's sad, but that's the reality, right? Um, unfortunately. Uh, well, Fel, what, did you want to add something? Um, I mean, I absolutely agree with what everyone was saying. Um, and I, I mean, for me, yes, my parents, you know, explained kind of our tribe and just from my own knowledge, but I never really, you know, had that as, as a kind of, um, like a standard in regards to who I knew were, you know, who I associated myself with, because to me, it was, I, it was really out of ignorance of not knowing kind of anything beyond that. And I think that's kind of an injustice that our parents did for us is in their eyes, maybe they were protecting us kind of from, you know, all everything that was happening. But at the same time, I feel like we know more about the, the American history and we know more about world history than we know our own. Hmm. And we said before that Sudanese are very, we're not good at documenting um, kind of what is what's happening and, you know, what has happened in our history. And that, that really is an injustice to us because then we don't know what's happening with Darfur. We don't know what's happening with South Sudan. We don't know what's happening with the New Mountains until we meet people our age who are able to come and tell us and explain to us, this has been going on, this is what's happening. And then we learn from each other, but it's our responsibility now to make sure that that's being taught throughout and it's mm. not just in bits and pieces or what people want you to think or people want you to see. And um, I think for that, it, it really does come back to accountability that now it's our turn to make sure that our actual story is being told so that mm. we aren't, you know, combining everyone together and kind of losing out with, in regards to everyone's stories. All right, all right. I couldn't agree more. I appreciate that. Um, we're actually coming up on an hour here. I do have one more question for all of you. Um, and then uh, I want to turn over to Ruth Ann to see if we have any questions from the audience um, that you guys want to answer. Um, but my last question, going back to just the idea of um, being secure in your identity, regardless of you know the, the path you took to be where you are today, do you have any advice on that? Because it's like we all agree here, right? It's been an exhausting ass just existence, right? Is there something that maybe you took from your experiences, good or bad, that maybe informed how you go about your life now with your new idea of your identity or whatever you accept as your identity now? Do you have any advice for maybe younger folks who are struggling with this or maybe even older folks who still have yet to reconcile these different conflicts. Wafa, do you want to start? Um, Wafa, well, I think you're still, are you muted still? Can you guys hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Um, for the older community, I think it's really important that we kind of come together and realize that Sudan is changing and it's changing in respect to the country. It's changing in respect to kind of leadership, I hope. Um, but it's also changing in respect to us getting older and being raised here that, you know, we have a lot to bring to Sudan and we have a lot that, that we can be able to bring our country into a light where, you know, it's able to be seen as um, a country that's thriving because we all have something to offer. Um, and for the younger generation, um, we've all been where you are um, in regards to, you know, struggling with your identity. And we're, I mean, me as a woman, I'm always told that I have four strikes against me, right? I'm a woman, I'm dark skinned, I'm Muslim, and I'm an immigrant. And um, I don't want those to be kind of handicaps for me or have them be considered um, kind of something that holds me back from anything. Um, yes, I am a woman, but, you know, it's my responsibility to make sure that my journey is to discover who my authentic self is and share that and make sure I'm teaching that to the world. And being a Muslim, all that means is that my heart belongs to my creator and my mind is an extension of that. My hijab is my shield, my sword, 
words. And it's my responsibility to remind you that God demands respect for women. And we are all merely creations of that. And being dark skinned, um, that's not a badge of shame. That should be something that you you completely love about yourself. You know what I mean? Especially for dealing with colorism in our community. That's something that you should definitely hold true for yourself. Um, and being an immigrant, I mean, just being able to come from a country and having your parents come from a country and, you know, building that strength to be able to figure out where you fit in, that should be something that's celebrated, not something that, you know, is going to hold anyone down. Um, so I think it's really important for, for them to realize that what they think are strikes against them are actually their strengths. Most definitely, most definitely. Uh, Hadji, would you like to speak on this? Um, I was just going to say to let them know that, like, we've all navigated through it and we're still continuing to navigate through it. So um, just to continue to have those conversations with your friends and your family and just to make sure you have that support system and just to never feel like you're less than or you're you're inadequate because you're more than enough and like you never have to prove to yourself to anybody, anybody, no matter what they say. You're always who you are and stay true to yourself. Do not change for anyone. Yes, ma'am. Rami, uh, would you like to add? Yeah, um, I feel like there's a disconnect between the younger generation that was born and raised here and the generation of the parents that immigrated here, right? And I feel like the older generation should be very careful in trying to speak for the younger generation, right? Because their experiences are different from the, their parents' experiences. And a lot of times by trying to speak for them or forcing them into a certain identity all you do is pass on your traumas and your um you know negative or whatever experiences that you have on to them mm. and because i've seen like firsthand certain uh, uh sudanese people that might identify as, as arab or they um they are pro bashir right and I, and, and i've these are people that talk negatively um, about maybe darker skinned Sudanese from specific regions. And then I see their children grow up and their best friends go with someone from South Sudan. So there's a complete disconnect. And mm. the older generation should really allow the young people to speak for themselves and, 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 and make their own voices heard and tell their stories, right? Mm. You got to bring them to the forefront and they need to share their stories. And for the younger people, don't allow anyone to put you in a box. And, and, and I keep saying this over and over again because I really don't feel like I came, uh, like I didn't find peace within myself until I really accepted the fact that I'm, I don't have to be Sudanese or American. This is just who I am. There's all these different layers to me, right? So don't allow someone to tell you who you are and be prepared for criticism because, you know, that's just how it is. You will face criticism, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dad, would you like to add anything? Uh, yes, uh, I think it's it's important. I think my, my advice for me is that identity is fluid. You know, I think it, it's just we forget that, as you said before, conversation identity was fluid. People migrated, people moved, moved to a different community, became part of that community. Identity has always been fluid in Africa because of migration, because of our diversity. You know, ethnic wise, culture wise has always been fluid and we have always migrated from one place to another to come completely to something new. And so it's it's our story, you know, how we left Sudan and we're now in the United States. That's a whole mm -hmm. different identity. That means identity is fluid. It's not mm -hmm. something you can force or shove down someone's throat. You know, it's something that you give people, you know, the ability to choose for themselves the identity they identify with and that they want to, you know, they want to keep, you know, and that's mm. the thing about identity. I think the older generation is so traumatized, you know, coming from, you know, our country being colonized, you know, gaining independence, having to live through wars and genocides, you know, leaving your own country. They're so traumatized that they think identity is set in stone. I have mm. to pass. There's a difference between teaching history and also, you know, and force, forcing assimilation, you know, mm. You know, even within your own household, you know, and, and I, I seen that, you know, where people force tribalism on the younger generation. Now the younger uh, generation are fueling the tribalism. 
that was taught to them by their parents. And so that in itself is not teaching history. You're doing this, this to history. And so identity is fluid. And my, my advice to younger generation, history is important. You know, mm. the more we educate ourselves on our history, family background, migration, uh, regions, you know, the better we have understanding of who we are ourselves, but the better we have understanding of Sudan itself and Africa. And, and that in itself eliminates the idea or oh, I belong to this tribe, thus I'm only this tribe. No, right. There's no such thing as purity when it comes to Africa. We are the most genetically diverse place on the planet. Yes, purity sir. is possible when you have in a country with over 500 ethnicities. There's no such thing as purity, right? Yeah. You might be from that ethnicity, but that is, that is because that is where you're geographically located now. Right. Wait until you know, 30 years from now where you're geographically located, right? And so right. there's no such thing as purity. And so teach history and let the younger generation choose for themselves and pick out what they want to keep and what they want to move forward to the next generation and pass down. That's how we create, you know, I say true peace, transformative peace, you know, within ourselves, but on a wider societal level, you know, that in us, that in itself is how we reconcile. It's how we heal, you know, um, because that in itself puts down the fruits of change that we want to see in society. Uh, of who we want to see represent us as our government officials, our representatives on the you know state levels, city levels. Those how we raise people in our household. Those are the people that become representatives for us. And so, right. if we don't do our duty, you know, we end up raising those individuals we we misraise become our representatives. And then right. when they become you know when they get to power and do the things they do, understand where they come from and who raised them. And that's mm -hmm. how we get there. And so, so education is important. Identity is fluid. It will always be fluid until the end of time. And so give yes, people sir. the liberty and the freedom to choose for themselves. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I agree with everything you guys said. That's uh, about as you know, clear as it can get, to be honest, because it's, it's all messy and it's all based on very personal experiences. So you just got to do what you can do. Um, on your point, Dao, like with, uh, you know, allowing them the uh, freedom to choose their identity, I, I couldn't agree more. And if I were to, you know, advise, like my little sister generation, right, she's the, the Gen Z generation. And I'm telling y'all, these Gen Zers are reckless in the best way possible, right? So if that's what y'all are, I mean, keep it, keep it going, because they, they question everything. They're, they, they ask, you know, why things are the way they are, um, and if it doesn't vibe with them, they find something else, and that is the epitome of, you know, identity freedom, right? And so just keep being our reckless selves, right? <laughs> um, so now let's uh, jump into Q&A. Looks like we got three questions. Oh, snap, Bentley's in the house. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, let's start with Esther. Um, Esther says, remarkable change has occurred in Sudan. Uh, but there is a certain level of uncertainty given the ongoing role of military leaders linked with Bashir. How do you imagine the future of Sudan and how can the international community provide support? Um, Dao, given your international relations, do you want to start us off? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I th the road and the journey ahead is, it certainly is, is full of uncertainty. Uh, it's, it's one that, you know, it's difficult uh, because we have to be honest and be realist in this moment that we are in that, you know, that we have certain individuals who were, you know, protectors of the past regimes who are in the, you know, in the council and run the country right now. So those very institutions that were oppressing people are still there. It's the reason why we're still seeing, you know, state violence in the peripheries, you know, whether it's in Kurdufan or in Darfur, where people are in sittings, demanding reform, demanding that militias be dismantled and abolished because those instruments of violence are still there in place. And so I think the best way for us to engage the international community is for us to be honest with ourselves that, you know, the revolution wasn't just Khartoum, you know, the revolution 
it was all Sudan. You know? mm. Revolution happened in far places in the rural area, in the villages, in the towns that people haven't even heard of. And they're fighting battles that are 10 times greater than those who are privileged like ourselves were fighting. It's mm. unimaginable the battles that they're fighting. They're, they're fighting for basic, basic human rights, the right to live, the right to go and farm without being, you know, being killed by, by, by militia, um, you know, the right to go fetch water, you know, these are just so simple, so basic, but yet they don't have the freedom to do so because they're afraid of the state violence that is there, that is present at every moment, at every level. So the best thing we can do is be honest with ourselves in the diaspora, uh, recognize our privilege, and not speak over those who have experienced the mm -hmm. instrument of violence that the state inflicted on people. And yes, so sir. once we recognize this, it means that we're able to hear voices there are usually marginalized voices that we usually don't put on a panel or on a pedestal to hear their experience. Because hearing one's experience, that changes your whole perspective and your whole view. Because mm. now, you know, I saw this the other day, you know, it was like the price of bread in Khartoum and someone was comparing it to the price of bread in Kadukli. Mm. It's, it's three times, it's three times the price. One country, you know, the, okay. the bread price in Khartoum and Kadukli. That in itself just shows you, it's just like, things might be getting better in Khartoum, but are they getting better elsewhere? Mm. And so us being, recognizing that and educating ourselves in the diaspora because we have the greatest influence mm -hmm. than those back home because of the positions we're in, uh, the skill sets, the education we have, we can put, we can put pressures on our elected officials at the state level, at the national level, to make sure that they still keep an eye on Sudan, to make sure that it change, transformative change is not taking place, means that you don't, you don't feed the regime uh, it, 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 that allowed and enabled you know, the military leaders themselves to hijack the revolution. Mm. Totally, I couldn't, that's very well said. Thank you for sharing that. Um, does anyone uh, want to add anything? Yeah, I feel like uh, bridging the gap like we have to really even make a conscious effort into learning about other people, about people from different parts of Sudan from those people's own mouths. Mm. Um, one of the issues I see now post-revolution is we're going back to where Khartoum becomes Sudan. Mm. And Sudan is much bigger than Khartoum. This centralizing of, of everything, right? This idea of what it means to be Sudanese is based, even us in the diaspora, we make the mistake of, you know, when we fly back to Sudan, a lot of us only go to Khartoum. We say, hey, I'm going to Sudan. Who's going to Sudan? Well, what are you talking about? What part of Sudan? Mm -hmm. Right? Khartoum is not, is not really Sudan. Our idea of what it means to be Sudanese when we go for a month or two, go to Ozone and, and, and eat Biscuit Royale and take pictures <laughs> in front of the Bajrawiya pyramids and we come back and forget it. No, there's, Sudan is much more than that. You have to, visit people, if possible, from the rural areas, from the marginalized regions. Mm. And because if, listen, there's people right now protesting in Darfur, right? Mm -hmm. they, those mm -hmm. people have, and they've, they've been fighting this fight for a lot longer than last year. Yep. The, the real revolution did not occur just last year. Mm -hmm. It's been happening for decades. And, and at the root of it is this marginalization of, of people. Everything on the outskirts is forgotten about. Mm. And, and governments have only focused on the capital city. So by, by really consciously making an effort to learn about each other's different cultures and to celebrate the diversity, I feel like we can maybe, um, maybe slow down this whole centralization of, of, of what it means to be Sudanese and mm. the focus on Khartoum. For sure, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. Um, anyone else want to add? I'll just say to touch upon what Rami said, like, people really need to realize, like, it's not just Khartoum, and mm -hmm. this revolution needs to be inclusive in the sense that it needs to account for everybody. Everybody needs these human rights, and I think on top of that, it's the accountability and the transparency, because the same former regime that so-called fell, they're mm -hmm. still in position in Darfur in those areas. They are still in power. Nothing has changed at all, mm -hmm. and this is why you see people constantly still fighting um, for their basic human rights. Like I was saying, just like to go, to be able to tend to your farm, 
so that you don't die because of famine like simple things that people deserve to do and you think it's like it's we're not asking they're not asking for a lot right. really, it's really not it's really not that hard and also there needs to be justice and accountability like in terms mm-hmm. of the war crimes that were committed like they have yet to see that they have mm-hmm. yet to see that and i don't i don't think like until they get that i i, I need closure like i need the accountability for those people who committed the war crimes to get tried mm-hmm. yeah I totally agree. Wafa, do you want to add anything? Um, I mean, just with what with, with, with everyone was saying, I really think, you know, um, we celebrated one year anniversary. And to me, that was, well, what is it that we're really celebrating? I mean, this is still going on. You uh-huh. know what I mean? Like, it was really just, yes, everyone came out and supported and everything, but there's still people that are suffering. So what is it exactly that we're celebrating? you know and um again it goes back to education like you know not knowing what's going on and not being able to to stand for what's going on out of straight ignorance so being able to hear it from people you know that have been there people being able to tell their stories you're able to bring it to light you're able to you know like Daoud was saying have those stories be told from that person's perspective so that way it's not just you know, third information, it's actual information coming from that person. And then once everyone is able to come together and figure out like, you know, what's going on and ways that we can have the government work on trying to get it better, then we can say we can can celebrate. But I just, I don't see what we're celebrating right now. It's not, it's, it's not reality for me right now because I, I mean, there is so much going on and I, I don't feel that it's fair to say that we're celebrating, you know, a year of a revolution when the revolution is still going on. All right, I couldn't agree more. And like I just said, like the most frustrating part of it is like seeing these people who caused so much pain in, uh, in the past and even now who get to be their own judge and jury and, you know, make the rules for themselves and no justice gets passed. It's the most infuriating thing to see anywhere you know just living with that unfairness and being aware of it is is pretty pretty harsh and i so i totally agree with Haji. i think that's a good first step is accountability so then people don't you know think that they are ever above the law or ever above um humanity to be honest right um and funny enough and i totally agree with what you said though like the uh when you said uh you know we in the diaspora need to you know shut up and listen to the people that really are going through it that was actually one of the questions i wanted to ask you guys but i was like scrolling a little too fast and i glossed over it but i was wondering like have any of y'all felt that like uh any like clapback from from those because sometimes i see some people here in the states for example posting stuff and i'm like all right y'all don't really know what's going on <laughs> uh rami i'm curious what you think about that yeah um well i said this in the movie and i'm so glad bentley <laughs> put it on on film because mm-hmm. We get very passionate, right, about <laughs> about what's going on sometimes, and I feel like we, you know, overstep our boundaries a little bit. Mm. It's okay to have opinions, but right. we have to be very careful not to give direction to those on the ground because we are not facing bullets, mm-hmm. right? We're here on Zoom, and we'll go walk, shut this off, and go on about our day when we're done. Mm-hmm. We're not facing, you know, being arrested and, and killed. So we really have to check ourselves first and foremost, and... I feel like a part of it has to do with the ego, even mm. if it's not like consciously, subconsciously, some of us might feel like I have this education from the Western world. And so I know what to do. But in reality, we don't. Mm. We don't. There are very much capable leaders on the ground. And we need to trust them and believe in them. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, one thing I just want to touch on the previous question that I really wanted to say um, about the whole accountability and, and Khartoum and, and marginalization. The reason why the government, the reason why there is, for example, such a drastic change in the price of bread between Khartoum and Kadubli, for example, is because the people that are in power, who are really an extension of the Bashir regime, they understand very well that if Khartoum is comfortable, they are not going out and protest in support of other regions in Sudan. Mm-hmm. And the proof of that is that Himeti, who is the guy that's really killing people in Darfur for so many years, he's the most powerful man in Sudan at the moment. 
and very few people are seem to be upset with that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's it seems very. Sometimes Loki, I'd be thinking like, are we? I feel like we're in an episode of Twilight Zone or something, because this dude's on TV regularly. I'm like, come on, y'all. We just had three months of like going through this dude's dirty ass history, right? And here we are watching him on national, you know, television or Sudan national television, just shaking hands with other diplomats and living like he didn't murder countless people, right? It's very, very frustrating. But uh, no, I appreciate you guys' uh, input on this. Um, I'm going to go back into the Q&A. All right. Uh, Esther, I think we answered your question already. All right, there you go. Bentley Brown. While someone dealing with dual identities might fit in everywhere and nowhere at the same time, the rejection from one side or another, such as from the US or Sudan, can be very tough. I was shocked recently to see a friend in Khartoum an activist very connected to the diaspora community, tweet, quote, can the Sudanese diaspora please shut the F up, end quote. Funny thing is Sudanese from the outer regions might say, quote, can Khartoum Sudanese please shut the F up. How do you personally negotiate the debate over ownership and on authenticity of Sudanese identity? Anyone wanna start, start it off? Uh. I'll start it off. I don't, it's not necessarily the ownership that I think that people are asking for. I think people are asking for the most marginalized among us to be put up front and in front of our fight. Because mm. for the long time, they're, they're just kind of, you know, they're just kind of the, the hanging tail in the back, right? Nobody pays attention to them. Nobody knows that they even exist. And so this idea, because let's say I'm comfortable in Khartoum, it doesn't mean that everything is comfortable outside because th this idea we have is just like, even as Americans, it's just, it's an issue we have. People don't travel to regions like Rami said, you know, people are just stuck at where they are and that's it. You know, most people just live, born, live where they are and die where they are. And so mm -hmm. they don't know what else exists on the outside. And so it's, it's the same here in the diaspora. You know, because relatives might be telling them, you know, things are better here in Khartoum. Well, mm -hmm. are things better, you know, in Al-Fasha, you know? And it's just, you know, it, 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 it's just that idea to, it's okay to recognize your privilege and say, hey, I'm privileged. I'm, I'm in a place that's better than most people. But just mm -hmm. because the place that's better than most people does not mean that we are all in that same place. And so, that it, it, people have such a hard time understanding that because they'll go, oh, we're all, we, we're all oppressed. Yes, we are all oppressed, but there are degrees to oppression. Mm -hmm. We know this, there are degrees to oppression. And so, and we all don't face those degree to, of oppression the same ways, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like a, as, as women face, you know, the, the oppression they face in society is not the same to the oppression that men face in society. And so, there are degrees to oppression and it's okay to recognize that. It does not take away the oppression that you have faced and experienced yourself, you know? It just mm -hmm. means it adds to your knowledge of who you are as a whole human being to learn and continue to grow. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. I have a friend of mine that says, uh, let's not turn this into the oppression Olympics, right? We're all struggling, but sometimes you gotta prioritize some things over the others. It's not, it's not always the, what about me? <laughs> um, Anyone else would uh, want to add to this? I think it's also important to um, not invalidate how someone feels. You know, mm -hmm. like we, there are different levels, but at the same time, um, you feeling some way, you know, don't invalidate what someone else is feeling because I feel that, you know, with everything that was going on in, in Khartoum, that kind of invalidated what was going on throughout history for everybody else because it was more it was more publicized it was more you know it was it was everywhere social media tv changing you know your profile picture blue songs came out but that kind of invalidated everything that was going on before that because there there wasn't as much publicity so i think it's really important that you know to make sure that we're not doing that in the future for sure for sure, I totally agree. Um, we are coming up on an hour 30. Uh, we have one more question, but real quick, Hajir Rami, do you guys wanna add anything to this or should I check the next question? 
All right. From Ariana, uh, I'm not going to say last names because, you know, the world's kind of scary with the internet. So how does everyone think we can improve regarding learning more about the history, more classes, hosting events, or doing more discussing? Um, it seems kind of general, like a, when we say we, I don't know what Ariana means by we, but let's tap, let's say like as a Sudanese diaspora, as Americans, as global citizens, anyone want to take over? I think I would just say it comes down to unlearning what we've been taught and recognizing that that's not the whole truth and actively trying to learn and do better and educate ourselves and have those conversations with other people um, outside of Khartoum and just see like what their um, experience was and see how we can be more inclusive and just owning up to how you played a role. Like I said before, like how you were privileged enough and you were complicit and mm -hmm. apologizing for the hurt that you caused other people, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and seeing like how you can move forward in order to build a better Sudan that's inclusive for everyone there. Mm -hmm. For sure. Anybody else want to add? Yeah, I think it's just being, being willing to learn, but to be willing to learn, be open-minded to new ideas and new things. Uh, it's okay to learn new information. And it's okay to change your mind because of that new information that you learn. It means you're growing, right? And so be willing to learn, seek to learn, because that in itself helps you understand and it gives you different perspectives and lens of the issues that you didn't know before. And so that in itself, that's how we, we become better allies, but it's how we become better human beings, our better selves, you know, because we're continually learning and unlearning things that we have been taught. And so... You know, whether you're here in the diaspora or back home, it's all connected. It's all interconnected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, anyone else? Um, okay, so, uh, and I, I just wanted to add on to like uh, Ariana's question. So like say for non-Sudanese people, for people who um, don't have as much as at stake um, with the whole situation. Uh, Dao, because of your background, right? Um, in international relations, dealing with uh, the global community, something up your alley. Do you have advice for maybe non-Sudanese people if they want to get more involved with this, how they would go about that? Yeah, I, I, I think it's okay to get involved. It's, it's always welcome, you know? It's always, it's, it's, it's okay to support, but make sure that you're putting the voices of those that it affects the most in front. Learn from them, you know, get the information from them, you know, make sure that information is authentic. That in itself, that how that is how you better help them. You know, you know, you, I can give you a fish, right? That will feed you that day, but teach me to fish. And so what we should be doing as Sudanese people is educating our allies to be better allies and to help us in a way that creates meaningful change, not in a way that helps us today, and then tomorrow we're left with nothing. Mm, for sure. Uh, cool, we have, oh, we got one more question. Came in a minute ago. Uh, okay, we just answered this one pretty quick. Um, Lee says, with such a variety of identities across Sudan, is there now, post-revolution, more room than before in Sudan for a national identity that can overcome differences and be inclusive for everyone? Is there more room in, uh, than before in Sudan for that? Um, I feel like that idea is, uh, is a lot more, it's in the spotlight a lot more than it was before. Mm. Uh, this idea of the, the Sudanese identity being at the forefront is being spoken about quite a bit, like from what I've seen. Um, again, I just want to make sure that while we chase that common Sudanese identity, we don't overlook and aid in the erasing of people's identities, ethnicities, heritage, and culture. Mm. Because Sudan is diverse. And if you try to cover it all with just one, like paint, like then paint it with one paintbrush, you might actually be aiding in the marginalization of those people. And that only leads to more trouble. So our unity is through our diversity, is through mm -hmm. our accepting of our differences and celebrating those differences. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're Sudanese and, and I love that idea that we can come together as Sudanese people as one but that one Sudanese identity is made up of hundreds of smaller identities from within. Mm -hmm. 
for sure. Um, before we uh, sign out here, anyone want to add anything to that question or add anything in general? Last, last thoughts? Cool. All right. Well, uh, Ruth Ann, if you want to take over, uh, it's been fun, y'all. <laughs> Thank you, Macaulay. Thank you so much, everyone. I am just so appreciative of your presence here and listening to this conversation, just the depth and the sincerity and the openness that you are sharing with. And I just, I think there's something so um, significant and so important about people who have had identities and experiences that span different contexts and different cultures, because I think we're being so pushed to be polarized and be in these dualistic mindsets um, in the world in so many ways. And I think that just your ways of being in the world and the ways that you have metabolized the experiences that you and your families have had is just something that is so powerful. And really I, the word healing has come up a lot in the last um, couple of discussions that was interesting to me. And I, I just think that it is really, uh, um, just a beautiful, a beautiful thing to have this opportunity to engage with us with all of you and just thank you so much. It is really so profound. Um, I put a message in the chat to everyone. This is going to be recorded and we don't have a, we have about 35 people with us live today, but it's going to be available on the internet. And I think this is something that um, can be shared and is so relevant to um, not only the Sudanese context and um, the continuation of the transition to full democ democratic civilian government in Sudan, but also with all the events that are unfolding around race and privilege and the hierarchies that are in the United States as well. And so I know that that is an added challenge to straddle so many different um, so many different ways of being and so many different facets of your identity. But thank you for doing that and thank you for sharing that with us. And I have a lot of other thank yous because um, we have so many partner organizations that are co-presenting with us that were also as excited as we were about these conversations and about um, highlighting and really expanding and broadening the conversations that we saw in Revolution from Afar and just a glimpse and, and being able to have a chance to um, to hear more about those. And our partners include um, in addition to Never Again Coalition, our organization, Amnesty International USA, Group 48, PSU, which is Portland State University's Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project, the Portland State University Conflict Resolution Department, and the Portland State University Conflict Resolution, um, pardon me, the Middle East Studies Center, World Oregon, SAND, Sudan Unlimited, Act for Sudan, the Sudanese American Public Affairs Association, IACT, Cool Islam, Cascade Festival of African Films, and the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I'd like to especially thank the Oregon Jewish Museum for providing our tech Zoom platform and Amber Kirsten, who is our tech genius, who is really making all of this possible behind the scenes. Um, our registration remains open for our series. We're right at the midpoint. We have two more panel discussions on the next two Saturday mornings. You can Encourage others to register. Register if you're watching this recorded and haven't yet at www.neveragaincoalition.org forward slash rising up forward slash Sudan. And you can find some actions on our Rising Up series landing page, which is neveragaincoalition.org never forward slash Sudan hyphen action. Our current work is revitalizing the Sudan caucus in the US Congress, supporting the Youth Peace and Security Act, and also supporting the Sudan Democratic Transition Accountability and Financial Transparency Act of 2020. Please follow um, the artists and follow our participants. They're out there on social media and they have amazing things to say. And um, last but not least, if you value this programming, you are able to donate to the Rising Up for Human Dignity series on the series website. And those costs or those donations will go directly to direct programming costs like screening fees for films. So we can also support our artists. Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you next Saturday.